In August 1992, when the dog days were drawing to an end, I set off to walk the county of Suffolk in the hope of dispelling the emptiness that takes hold of me whenever I've completed a long stint of work. And in fact, my hope was realized up to a point. For I've seldom felt so carefree as I did then, walking for hours in the day through the thinly populated countryside, which stretches inland from the coast. I wonder now, however, whether there might be something in the old superstition that certain ailments of the spirit and of the body are particularly likely to beset us under the sign of the dog star. Zebelt, Winifred Georg Zebelt, was born in Vertech im Allgäu in the Bavarian Alps in 1944. He studied in Germany at Freiburg, and in 1967 he moved to England, first to Manchester and then to East Anglia, to Norwich, where he settled and lived out his working life as a professor of European literatures and literature and translation. At, at the University of East Anglia. And success came late to him. He wrote his books first in German and then carefully oversaw their translation into English. And it was when the books began to appear in English that his rise in the English-speaking literary world began. Max came to the Harville Press we were all sitting around there, everybody in the company in Max, and one of the questions we asked him was, which category would you like your book to be in? And Max said, um, oh, I'd like all the categories. I want fiction, I want biography, I want autobiography, I want travel, I want history, I want probably didn't say Holocaust studies, but anyway, there wasn't a category that he didn't require. Well, it turns out that when you're dealing with the people who do the classification, they will only allow you three, because humorists of the Zebalian kind will obviously go for all of them, on the utterly mistaken assumption that booksellers would be forced to have a copy in each shelf. But it doesn't work like that. So there were three. And I don't honestly remember what the final three were, but Max was very clear. And what he was saying, turn it round if you like, was, don't put me in a box. I want to be in all the boxes. You know, I'm not writing a familiar formula. Well, one of the odd things about the book is that it, it begins as an account of somebody having finished a book. Um, because he's finished a piece of writing and he now feels apparently carefree. And it seems to me the book starts inviting you to imagine what it's like to feel suddenly released from something. He's going on this wonderful walk. Within several lines, he couldn't be more depressed. It's just like the thing Freud says about headaches. The moment somebody says to themselves, God, isn't it marvelous? I haven't had one of those headaches for ages. That's a sign they're about to get one. Sable says, I felt incredibly free carefree, and suddenly he's not free and full of cares. Later, in one of the long hothouses built against the brick walls of the kitchen garden, I struck up a conversation with William Hazel, the gardener who now looks after Summer Layton with the help of several odd job men. When he realized where I was from, He told me that during his last years at school and his subsequent apprenticeship, his thoughts constantly revolved around the bombing raids then being launched on Germany from the 67 airfields that were established in East Anglia after 1940. People nowadays hardly have any idea of the scale of the operation, said Hazel. In the course of 1,009 days, the 8th Airfleet alone used a billion gallons of fuel 
dropped 732,000 tons of bombs and lost almost 9,000 aircraft and 50,000 men. Every evening I watched the bomber squadrons heading out over Summer Lake, and night after night, before I went to sleep, I pictured in my mind's eye the German cities going up in flames, the firestorm setting the heavens alight, and the survivors rooting about in the ruins. Often the narrator feels that he's kind of irradiated by a melancholy. He doesn't quite know where it comes from, and it colors the landscape. The book is literally full of geography in that almost every page has a place name on it that you can identify on a map. So I came up with this idea, fairly simple, of doing a digital project for mapping books where essentially I would take the locations that appear in books or locations around books and plot them on a digital map so you could zoom in and zoom out. And uh, The Rings of Saturn was the first book that I plotted. This red map serves as the core of his walking tour. And then at each place he mentions places around the world that are further removed. Then there would be a link out to those places on the surface, it's a walk in Suffolk and his experiences of uh, these uh, kind of landscapes down there, the beaches and the heaths and the, the kind of emptiness of that whole place. And then associated with it is uh, a whole encyclopedia of other things. So when he goes to places, he touches off on a certain writer or a certain event, and then the book kind of spirals out into something else. So it's a kind of walk, and then it's also this encyclopedia of people and things and events which interest him and which some of which are quite directly tied to the walk and some of which aren't. Like for me Silk is the center of this book in some ways because of how carefully um, Zabald kind of silts Silk around throughout the chapters. It'll just be a little metaphor in one chapter. I think he mentions it in chapter one just for a second and then moves on foreshadowing what comes, you know, I think it's almost in the last chapter, right, that the silk thing finally happens. The title, The Rings of Saturn, is one of the more enigmatic titles amongst Max's books. It even in the original German had a subtitle, An English Pilgrimage, but it tells you something about the state of publishing today that we thought it better to leave the subtitle off because we didn't want people to think it was a travel book. Although it's enigmatic, once you've read the epigraph, it's one of the clearest of Max's titles. The second epigraph in the book is from a German encyclopedia which talks about the rings of Saturn as being fragments of a, a moon that wandered too close to the planet of Saturn and was shattered by the gravitational pull, but remains as a ring of dust particles forever circling the planet that destroyed it. So if you think of the way the rings of Saturn works as, a, as an attempt at several walks round an idea of England, um, in concentric rings made up of shattered fragments of a past, you begin to get the picture. The thing that it's closest to for me is Virginia Woolf's The Waves, where you just feel that there's a sort of an attempt to capture perception in all its really fleeting and really fast way in which we perceive and we put things together. But of course he constructs it so exquisitely. Every sentence is beautifully crafted. So I don't know what the genre is. I don't know. Probably none better to you than, than to me. Virginia Woolf, the wonderful example of her description of a moth uh, coming to its end on a window pane somewhere in Sussex. And this is a passage of some two pages only, I think, and it's written somewhere, chronologically speaking, between the battlefields of the Somme 
and the concentration camps erected by my compatriots. And uh, you know, there's no reference made to the battlefields of the Somme in this passage. But one knows, uh, as a reader of Virginia Woolf, that she was greatly perturbed by the First World War, by its aftermath, by the damage it did to people's souls, souls of those who got away and naturally of those who perished. So, you know, I, I, I think that uh, a subject which at first glance seems quite far removed from the undeclared concern of a book can uh, encapsulate that concern. And in Lowestoft, a pavement of fish glittering, an absolute tidal flow of fish, the abundance, the overabundance of the sea. That, that It's a moment when, when there's too much, that uh, the herring have come so close to shore, they've almost committed suicide and thrown themselves up. And there's nothing that can be done. The, the fish rot away, and there are, there are strange concepts of... Uh, trying to understand the luminescence of these fish and to and extract then, light from obviously it. Obviously, it's a postcard. Now, of course, the, the picture... So there's these hanging. small disjunctions that start to occur. You kind of... I took his word that that's herring. I wouldn't know what herring looks like. So, okay, that's herring. It's a little off. It's a postcard. Um, but, you know, as you move on, he's talking about the herring and about this sort of this wonderful color that is emitted when they die and... Yet, you know, he gives us this close-up of this large black and white fish, and I think you kind of just sort of breeze past that. It doesn't offer any information. It seems to um, just affirm what you're reading in a, in a very non-Zabaldian way. It usually doesn't do that. It doesn't illustrate things. If you're careful, you think, wow, I wish it was in color. I'd really love to see this kind of you know, effervescence and phosphorescence that occurs. And then I think this is one of the strangest images. It's talking about using this phosphorescence to light this passageway. And all I could see was these fins on the fish. You know, I'm starting to pick up this pattern between these fins. And then I see them here. And I kind of think, oh, well, that's kind of a clever artist thing. We do that all the time, you know, kind of start to work formally. And then the shock of sort of turning the page and seeing this image, I immediately had to go back and start to figure out where this began, you know, from somewhere to this end image. And I naturally started there because there is something that's very similar uh, between these images, you know, the dead fish and the This, to me, called out for interpretation. I felt I needed to go back and really pay attention. And it was the first time when I read The Rings of Saturn that that occurred. I think it's very hard to do this, to use this medium of book, you know, the linearity of a book, and to use the images to pull you back. It, that is why it is like a journey, um, even as you're reading it, because you're constantly having to go back. I was blown away. I really thought this is where we have to sort of stop and reconsider what he was doing. He's become very, very, very important for contemporary artists, I think. And, and for that reason, we have to also reconsider and think of him as both a writer and an artist. When I was writing about Siebold, I, I rang him up. I just rang up the university and said, can I speak to Professor Siebold? And I wanted to reproduce his photographs in the book I was writing and also in an exhibition. And I wanted to put across their particular mood, which I hadn't really seen before. And he explained that they were just um, sort of snappy snaps or boots, but 
he would put them on the photocopy of these colour prints and photocopy and re-photocopy until they had that black, smudgy, grainy look. And I said, could I borrow some for an exhibition? And he said, well, they're on a shelf and they're quite high up and it's on the other side of the room. And there was this long silence where I was wondering whether I should say, do you want to get up? And <laughs> Well, the, the spell of enchantment was cast on me by him um, about um, 12 years ago, and uh, I ended up wanting to write a book about him, and I realised that, I mean, he's a biographer. He, um, he's a biographer who walks his subjects back into life, or maybe he walks forwards after them into death. It's not never quite clear. It soon became obvious to me that the way to write about it, but I was wrong in this assumption, was to follow him, was to footstep his footsteppings of earlier feet and turn his own method back upon himself. And so I started to do that, and I, um, I rewalked most of the Rings of Saturn walk. And I really wanted it to be a grey day, and it wasn't a grey day, it was a bright day, and there were people bathing in the fountains at Lowestoft. And I realised very quickly that I was having far too much fun to footstep Sebald. Um, at Benneke Broad, I swam, um, and then I slept the night by a big bloom of poppies and woke up at dawn with a glorious easterly view and swam again. And um, my memory of that walk is one of delight really, and a refusal of the walk to conform to my idea of what the walk should have been. And so I realised that if I were going to write this book, I had to drop myself out of it entirely. I couldn't be there. It was a completely bad fit between footstepper and footsteppy. The zone, oh, in Stalker, of course, absolutely. This landscape that looks really sort of innocent and normal, and yet you can't move through it without it somehow ejecting you, and there's that magic place where you can go and get what you wish for, which is never what you think you want. Yes, maybe he makes Suffolk rather like the zone, but actually when you go to Suffolk and you walk some of his walks, you feel it is the zone. When I walked up to Benacre Broad, that weird landscape where the lake and the shingle beach are sort of almost butted up together, and you know that one day the lake's going to tip into the sea or the sea's going to tip into the lake. I was so frightened. I was actually carrying a video camera. I was so frightened. You can see it, the footage. I'm just, <laughs> just shaking and getting frightened. I couldn't actually go very far up towards Benacre Broad because it did feel like the zone. And do you remember in uh, Stalker, there's the man who ties the stones into the white handkerchief and throws them, at, and something in the zone guides where the stone lands, and then you can walk safely. And I definitely would have loved to have had a stalker with me. I was so frightened there. Dust-laden, mist-laden, penetrated by odd and misdirecting lights, the attempt here is really to become lost in a, a fog. Yes, well, in, in these kinds of natural phenomena, like fog, like mist, uh, which render the environment and one's ability to see it uh, rendered as almost impossible. There are always phenomena that interested me greatly. I mean, I, one of the great strokes of genius in standard 19th century fiction, I always thought, was the fog in Bleak House. You know? Oh, yes. And uh, it's uh, this ability to, to make uh, of one natural phenomenon a thread that runs through a whole text and, 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 and kind of upholds this, uh, this extended metaphor is something that I've, I find very, very attractive. The substances that recur, dust, ash, spume, cloud, vapour, and these are the substances of that coast, and they're all particular um, in both senses of that 
a wonderfully precise word. They're, they're specific, but they're also made up of particles. And he's fascinated by comminuted substances, substances that have been reduced down and down and down. Or on the, I think he talks once about them being on the borderline between being a nothingness. And you realize that this whole coast, actually, aerially, marinely, and terrestrially, is, is, com comprises these comminuted substances on which he's walking. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the study of nature in, in, in all its forms. I mean, the Walker's approach to viewing nature is a phenomenological one, and uh, the uh, scientist's approach is a much more incisive one. But they all belong together. For me, reading Sable is like a discovery. Given there's been so much schlock written about post-Holocaust writing and so much terrible exploitation of the Holocaust and all that, uh, Sable seemed to have a way, actually, of thinking about these issues in a way that was neither sensationalist nor self-pitying, but that could be, on the one hand, sort of grimly humorous, but also very, very straightforward. It was like the best version of journalism one could imagine. Really straightforward documentary writing that was really artful at the same time. You wanted to listen to this voice. The, the reader needs to be prompted that the narrator has a conscience and that he is and has been perhaps for a long time engaged with these questions. And uh, this is why you know, the, the main scenes of horror are never directly addressed. I think it is sufficient to remind people because we've all seen images, uh, but these images militate against our capacity for discursive thinking, for uh, uh, reflecting upon these things, and also paralyze, as it were, our moral capacity. So the only way in which one can approach these things, in, 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 in my view, is obliquely, tangentially, by, uh, by reference rather than by direct confrontation. He's in Southwold. He's in the Crown Hotel. And he's reading a copy of The Independent on Sunday. And he then sees this image of the people, as he says, hanged in rows like crows or magpies, Serbs, Jews and Bosnians. And he basically then talks about the Eustasha, which was the equivalent of the SS, basically, in Croatia in the war. Many historians regard them as, as even more terrifying than the, than the SS. I mean, they were... The, the methods of killing was pretty unimaginable. He then says that the documents relating to this, these killings are recorded in 50, he talks about 50,000 documents abandoned by the Germans and Croats in 1945, which are kept to this day in the Bozanska Kraina archive in Banja Luka. And then he describes the fact that this place, where the archives are now housed, was the headquarters of the Heres Group E Intelligence Division. And at this moment, I thought, hang on a minute, I've heard that name before that, that word, because that was the intelligence division that Kurt Valtheim worked in during the war. And then he described one of the Heres Group E intelligence officers at that time, he was a young Viennese lawyer whose chief task was to draw up memoranda relating to the necessary resettlements described as imperative for humanitarian reasons. And then he describes how he was, for this work, he was awarded the silver medal of the crown of King Zvonimir with oak leaves by the Croatian head of state, Pavlovich, who was kind of Hitler's ally, which was absolutely accurate and true. And then he describes that in later life, he um, occupied various high offices, among them that of Secretary General of the United Nations. And reportedly, it was in this last capacity that he spoke onto tape for the benefit of any extraterrestrials that may happen to share our universe, 
words of greeting that are now, together with other memorabilia of mankind, approaching the outer limits of our solar system aboard the space probe Voyager 2. And that idea that this man is the representative of humanity. As the Secretary General of the United Nations, an organization of 147 member states who represent almost all of the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. We step out of our solar system into the universe seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon to be taught if we are fortunate. We know full well that our planet and all its inhabitants are but a small part of this immense universe that surrounds us and it is with humility and hope that we take this step. As I sat there that evening in Southwold, overlooking the German Ocean, I sensed quite clearly the Earth's slow turning into the dark. The huntsmen are up in America, writes Thomas Brown in the Garden of Cyrus, and they're already past their first sleep in Persia. The shadow of night is drawn like a black veil across the Earth. And since almost all creatures from one meridian to the next lie down after the sun has set, so he continues, one might, in following the setting sun, see on our globe nothing but prone bodies, row upon row, as if leveled by the scythe of Saturn, an endless graveyard for a humanity struck by falling sickness. Saturn is the planet who rules over melancholy. The planet Saturn was connected to the bile, as Mars, the planet of war, was connected to cholera, to anger. And the black bile was thought by Renaissance medical thinkers and by the philosophers to be this source of depression. Depression was, in those days, and of course to some extent today too, considered to be very productive of art and inspiration. So though the melancholic suffered a great deal, the melancholic was also inspired and creative, more creative than other people. In this tradition of melancholy, it's as though these people, or people who feel this, are people who feel some inexplicable sense of loss. And they're people who try and locate this in history, as in, why am I feeling so fundamentally at a loss and so um, unattached? And it's as though the history gives you some sort of story about this, but the feeling is somehow that there's been some catastrophe that can't be located and that one is living in the aftermath of that catastrophe. Sebald hears that there was a little pleasure train that would take you to Southworld um, on a narrow gauge, I think. And he's told that the old engine had, underneath the black paint, it had a Chinese golden dragon, and that it had originally been made for the emperor to travel about in, in Peking. But he then goes off into one of his most superb fugues about the last days of imperial China and the reign of the Empress Dowager, Zhu Xi. The Taiping Rebellion was actually put down very, very bloodily indeed. And it was a story of great horror. It's another example of where he's using something else to refract his main preoccupation. The, the genocidal wars of the 20th century were foreshadowed by these Victorian imperial wars. He's actually also making you think about travel routes as well. He, I mean, he invokes the Silk Road. 
So his walks meander, his mind meanders, and the pattern of the structure of the book meanders. I don't know if anybody's actually done a map of the rings of Saturn, of how the motifs actually can be played out and related to one another. So I was writing about the book, and as I was reading the first chapter, I made a little sort of marginal flow chart of what the material consisted in the first chapter. And as soon as I made this for the first one, I started making them for every chapter. Um, and then when I was done, I thought, well, why the hell shouldn't I just make one big, huge graph of the whole thing? Green is the beginning of a chapter, red is the end of a chapter, but then as I went on, I started adding blue for death or despair. <laughs> and um, there's more blue uh, sort of towards the end of the book. I, don't, I wouldn't know how else to talk about my relationship to this book but to use the word love, because that's how I feel about it. I mean, it's like a personal relationship. I think that you fall in love with the meandering because the book allows you to do that and gives you the room to do it. Some people experience that as being adrift in a way that makes them uncomfortable, and they're impatient with a book like this because they're not driven through the pages. And I think that impatience is a, is a manifestation of a kind of anxiety. They don't want the freedom to assemble the book for themselves. They want to be told what to think a little bit. The British tradition is of walking as recovery, and the American tradition is of walking as discovery, um, that striding forwards into the the oncoming air of the world for the romantic tradition, British romantic tradition, is a way to strip away the accretions of civilization, the hawking and hammering of time lived in cities, um, and return yourself to some original state. I mean, that's, that's Rousseau, as, I mean, it's European as well as it's British, but the American tradition, it's there in the road movie, it's there in the sense that we we travel to liberate ourselves, to discover new ways of being, to acquire whole um, new methods of life that may themselves turn into habits but don't begin as them. A strikingly large number of our settlements are oriented to the west and, where circumstances permit, relocate in a westward direction. The east stands for lost causes especially at the time when the continent of America was being colonized. It was noticeable that the townships spread to the west, even as their eastern districts were falling apart. And in Brazil, to this day, whole provinces die down like fires when the land is exhausted by overcropping, and new areas to the west are opened up. In North America, too, countless settlements of various kinds complete with gas stations, motels, and shopping malls, move west along the turnpikes. And along that axis, affluence and squalor are unfailingly polarized. I was put in mind of this phenomenon by the flight of Dunwich. It appears to be a picture taken at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, and it's of um, the cliff at Dunwich on the Suffolk coast which is dominated by the ruined silhouette of one wall with some arches in it and the tower of Dunwich Church, which, for anybody who knows that part of the world, is an image of transience if there ever was one, because that cliff retreats at such a rate. This church, I think, doesn't exist at all there now. Um, we used to go there a lot when I was a child because my grandmother uh, lived in a village just inland. My father's mother lived in a village just inland from Dunwich. Um, and we were made to stand on the cliff and keep quiet. It was probably a strategy of our parents to shut us up, but we were made to keep quiet so that we could hear the church bells ringing underwater, which, of course, we never did. Um, and, in fact, to strike a, a yet more personal note about it, it's a picture which has a particular resonance for me because it was later on those cliffs that my grandmother jumped off and committed suicide.
My way from Dunwich took me at first by the ruins of the Grey Friars Monastery, through a number of fields, and then to an overgrown scrubland, where stunted pines, birches, and rampant gorse grew so densely that the going was very hard. I was beginning to think of turning back, when all of a sudden the heath opened out in front of me. Shading from pale lilac to deepest purple, it stretched away westward, with a white track curving gently through its midst. Lost in the thoughts that went round in my head incessantly, and numbed by this crazed flowering, I stuck to the sandy path, until to my astonishment, not to say horror, I found myself back again at the same tangled thicket from which I had emerged about an hour before, or as it now seemed to me, in some distant past. Months after this experience, which I still cannot explain, I was on Dunwich Heath once more, in a dream, walking the endlessly winding paths again, and again I could not find my way out of the maze which I was convinced had been created solely for me. Like, I think it's Camus who said that he talked about the, the rip that can happen when you're just like wandering along and then things sort of rip or tear and you see things as they actually are. And then most of the time we just turn away and we sort of just sew it up and just sort of move on and don't notice it. But Sebald, I mean, it's like he has no skin or he has no mechanism by which he can sew it up and walk away from it. It rips. He sees another reality, and he just tips into it. And when I looked down from this vantage point, I saw the labyrinth, a pattern simple in comparison with the tortuous trail I had behind me, but one which I knew in my dream with absolute certainty represented a cross-section of my brain. So Thomas Brown is, is a really important figure for Zeebald in this book. Thomas Brown was a 17th century physician, theologian, philosopher, poet really. And he talks about this quincunx, which is this pattern that consists of five nodes essentially, uh, and five lines between them. And he, he, the notion being that this pattern exists everywhere in nature, sort of like a primitive network. And it's sort of a very Kabbalistic, pre-modern notion of, of seeing pattern in the world. And Zebald, I think, also in his writing, is looking for these sorts of patterns, how they occur in, in historical events and connections between people. He's always picking up on these sorts of uncanny connections. The uncanniness is very important. And one thing he writes about East Anglia is that East Anglia is really part of Germany because he says the Rhine used to come down and uh, uh, the, actually that's the mouth of the Rhine, you know, the East Anglia and Holland, so it's really a kind of German place that's kind of got, got marooned by mistake over there. At the end of his life, he did begin to write more about German subjects as well. You know, he came back to this uh, literature and uh, the air war and things like that. And the books are always about these exiles, you know, the, the, these people who have escaped Germany and living in England. But they're not always terribly happy in England, you know. They're kind of <laughs> Did Max become an Englishman? It's a very interesting question. Conrad certainly became very English. T.S. Eliot, an American, certainly became very English. Neither of them, I think, became Englishmen. I don't think that that's possible. No, Max was European, international in everything that he did. He loved England dearly. He loved the part of England that he made his home, East Anglia, intensely. But one of his closest friends there was the English poet, Michael Hamburger, brother of the English publisher, Paul Hamlin, who were both born in Germany and came to England in the 30s. So to me, his sense of being part of European culture was far more important than his national identity. Across what distances in time do the elective affinities and correspondences connect? 
How is it that one perceives oneself in another human being? Or if not oneself, then one's own precursor. The fact that I first passed through British customs 33 years after Michael, and I am now thinking of giving up teaching as he did, that I am bent over my writing in Norfolk and he in Suffolk, that we are both distrustful of our work and both suffer from an allergy to alcohol. None of these things are particularly strange. But why it was that on my first visit to Michael's house, I instantly felt as if I lived or had once lived there, in every respect precisely as he does, I cannot explain. Yeah. <laughs> Und das war auch unser Dorfladen und, und Postamt. Alles weg. I went out to Norwich in August of, of uh, 2001 to see Siebold in advance of the publication of Ausland. But he had told me that even though he lived in Norwich for 30 years, he didn't feel at all at home there. Uh, but then he said that he uh, felt even less at home in Germany, and he particularly disliked the sound of modern German and the way people spoke around him. Because the German that he used was, a, as, as he said, a 19th century German. So he, he said, uh, he, he asked me if, uh, if I knew the German word for, for mobile phone. And I didn't, and he said with a, a look of horror, it was a handy. So he, he wasn't at home in Germany. He wasn't at home in Norwich. So I, I asked him if he'd ever been in a place where he felt at home. I'll give you an example of Max when we were working on Vertigo, being very frustrated because at one point in that book, he wants to use the language of Nazi bureaucracy. and. He said to me once that the problem with English is you just you don't have the fascist language. We can't we can't do it. It just sounds ordinary. So we had to settle for the the, the plainest, um, not most bureaucratic language, but plain, plainest language we could manage, and hope that the the sense of the German. But we've got to realize we're not even reading Sebald's book. We're, we're reading a book by Michael Hulse, who's the translator. There's a strategy that he doesn't write directly into English. He writes in German, and then it's it's translated. And he could he I mean he could perfectly well translate it himself, but he chooses not to. So you've you've got another version which is already filtered, and it's not that different, I don't think, from the reports I've heard that the Midsummer Murders is sort of generic TV series set in a perfect English village. By the time it's translated into French, where it's very popular. Um, takes on a sort of existential gloss. It becomes something else. It's much moodier and weirder. Do you get many Fitzgerald or Omar Khayyam pilgrims coming here? Yes, we get a great many, rarely, in the summer, though, of course, being right out in the country here, we don't all know how many people, you know, do come. I've got here some of the lines from Omar Khayyam, as translated by Edward Fitzgerald on life after death. Strange is it not that of the myriads who, before us passed, the door of darkness through, not one returns to tell us of the road which to discover we must travel too. They weren't literal translations, but true in the general sense and their feeling for the original. Fitzgerald described the endless hours he spent translating this poem of 224 lines as a colloquy with the dead man and an attempt to bring to us tidings of him. The English verses he devised for the purpose, which radiate with a pure, seemingly unselfconscious beauty, feign an anonymity that disdains even the least claim to authorship, and draw us word by word to an invisible point where the medieval Orient and the fading Occident can come together in a way never allowed them by the calamitous course of history. Then he walks down to this Bull Inn, which I was astounded as well at most of these places you can find. And he goes, 
this is a great little bit of narrative. Then he goes to this this shop where he meets these strange. Oh, they don't have it. There's a beautiful uh, section in Vladimir Nabokov's novel, Transparent Things, where he talks about how when you concentrate on a material object, he says, the very act of attention may lead to our involuntary sinking into its surface. And he talks about, Nabokov has this beautiful phrase, the dream life of debris. And that seems to happen again and again in Zebel, that what begins as a, as a, as a particular um, object that is seen in all its specificity and, and, and radiance of that slowly shimmers, becomes a kind of quicksand, sucks the gaze of the viewer and the footfall of the walker down into it, and we find ourselves at Bergen-Belsen or in the Congo. The Rings of Saturn are, are a, a mental landscape. It's like Blake's mental traveller. But, like Blake, you know, he, he brings in names of the real, but into his own cosmology, which is made up of all sorts of things, including this constant sense of destruction, that the landscape he's describing is where the bombers, I mean, this is one of the key parts of the book, is this man he meets very early on, who, who talks about being a child and watching the fleets of, of bombers going over night after night to firebomb German cities. It's a kind of small detail that grows out of the English landscape very well. This is a defensive coast. It looks out onto the German Ocean, as Zebelt calls it, and it's bequeathed a sort of architectural paranoia. Much of the landscape has been constructed in order to resist invasion by humans, but also invasion by the sea, and that exerts a very powerful imaginative pressure on the walker. I wrote this essay called W.G. Sebel. It began with driving through the Dutch landscape and suddenly realising we were lost. And previously, I'd been given this sort of map of Berlin. I think we'd just moved to Germany, and I'd given the map of Berlin on a cloth, on a, you know, a handkerchief. And my father it immediately triggered something in him, and he remembered that he had found this cloth map. It had been blown out of an aeroplane as it crashed. Um, he just went and put his hands on it immediately. Uh, he said, well, I was near a place, and he leaned across the map and he, he said, Goch, right? This place, Goch. And then in February, I was driving around Holland on the borders with Germany, and I was with this curator, Rita Kirsting, and, and we were lost and she started to talk about it. Well, she came from a town near there, and I don't know what made me say it, but I just went, Goch, which is a tiny town, in fact. And she said, yes, how the hell did you know? And so there was that going on, and then parallel to that was Rufus Isaac, my great-great-uncle. His sister had bought a Van Gogh. Van Gogh's family came from Goch, and then, Realising that that took me to Marconi through his brother, Godfrey, who was the first managing director of the Marconi Corporation. At that point, I was reading the chapter on Roger Casement. I knew about Roger Casement. I've known about him for a while. And then, of course, I had a knife through the heart where I realised that it was my great-great-uncle, Sir Rufus Isaacs, who had been the hanging judge on that particular case. It was a true shock to me, actually, a true shock. There were all these connections, Sobaldian in a way, but also close to how I make my own work, which is relying on a sort of objective chance method where you go along and then something happens and it makes you take a different direction. Coincidences like dreams, if you talk about them, they become dead, they're inert. You know, they don't mean anything to anyone else. And the only thing you can do with them is to transmute them, to change them in some way, which is, of course, what Sabal does. He takes you down these poetic cul-de-sacs and you don't care that you're being led nowhere, of course, because you learn so much on the way. To this day, the area between Woodbridge and the sea remains full of military installations. Time and again, as one walks across the wide plains, one passes barracks, gateways and fenced-off areas 
where behind thin plantations of Scots pines, weapons are concealed in camouflaged hangars and grass-covered bunkers. The weapons with which, if an emergency should arise, whole countries and continents can be transformed into smoking heaps of stone and ash in no time. Not far from Orford, and already tired from my long walk, this notion took possession of me when I was hit by a sandstorm. I was approaching the eastern fringe of Rendlesham Forest, which covers several square miles, and was for the most part reduced to broken and splintered timber in the terrible hurricane of the 16th of October, 1987. Suddenly, in the space of a few minutes, the bright sky darkened and a wind came up, blowing the dust across the arid land in sinister spirals. The last flickering remnants of daylight were being extinguished, and all contours disappeared in the greyish-brown, smothering gloom that was soon lashed by strong, unrelenting gusts. The mealy dust streamed from left to right, from right to left, to and fro on every side, rising on high and powdering down, nothing but a dancing, grainy whirl for what must have been an hour, while further inland, as I later learnt, a heavy thunderstorm had broken. When the worst was over, the wavy drifts of sand that had buried the broken timber emerged from the gloom. Gasping for breath, my mouth and throat dry, I crawled out of the hollow that had formed around me like the last survivor of a caravan that had come to grief in the desert. A deathly silence prevailed. There was not a breath, not a bird song to be heard, not a rustle, nothing. And although it now grew lighter once more, the sun, which was at its zenith, remained hidden behind the banners of pollen-fine dust that hung for a long time in the air. This, I thought, will be what is left after the earth has ground itself down. I walked the rest of the way in a daze. I used to go up to Orford with my parents and my brother when I was little, quite often. But it was really only when I was more properly grown up that I heard the story of the Orford Merman, um, which goes roughly like this. I mean, it's many hundreds of years ago, this, and the fishermen at Orford, because Orford was then on the coast in a way that it absolutely is not now, because everything's silted up, um, caught in their nets what I suppose was something like the village idiot or an idiot from a village nearby. Um, anyway, somebody who was clearly very sort of ill and disabled in certain respects. Um, and in the story that's come down, they consider him to be a merman and they torture him to try and get him to speak. Um, so they tie him up in the ruins of the castle which uh, stands in Orford and they roast him in flame and poke various things into him and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, he's somebody who is incapable of speaking and eventually they let him go. So the whole thing has been a complete, at least a barbaric waste of time. They cut him down. They hauled him up the whirlpool of the stair. They dragged him past their wives and children gawping in the square. And silently, as though the words they used to know before were all dead now, they carried him down to the shingle shore. They slid him tail first in the sea and washed the bitter drops of blood crust from his finger ends and salt spit from his lips. 
and all the while, still silently, they watched the tide bring in a brittle, dimpled, breaking flood of silver through his skin, then open up his glistening eyes in which they saw their fear rise up to greet them one last time and fade and disappear, disappear while they stood back like mourners round a grave and watched his life ebb out of theirs, wave by wave by wave. When I was first in Orford, it was forbidden to approach the island. But now, there was no longer any obstacle to going there, since, some years before, the Ministry of Defence had abandoned secret research at that site. One of the men sitting idly on the harbour wall offered to take me over for a few pounds and fetch me later, after I'd had a look around. Once we were on the other side, I took leave of my ferryman and after climbing over the embankment, walked along a partially overgrown tarmac track running straight through a vast, yellowing field. The day was dull and oppressive, and there was so little breeze that not even the ears of the delicate, quaking grass were nodding. It was as if I were passing through an undiscovered country, and I still remember that I felt at the same time both utterly liberated and deeply despondent. When the National Trust were given the site, which was around 2000, they, they saw it first as a nature reserve. It was quite a troublesome one because lots of people in 4x4s used to zoom over the nests and there was lots of illegal stuff going on. They decided to try and preserve the melancholy, windswept, deserted atmosphere that Seabell describes and they put together a painter and a writer and an archaeologist, which had never happened in a conservation project before, where what tends to happen is the archaeologist and the military historian who will bring this weight of facts and explanation. They will tell you how radar works and what happened in this building. And it was the first time the National Trust consciously placed as much emphasis on atmosphere and association. And it was also the first time they said, let's just let the buildings fall down. They said, let's let them crumble over time and that was a really brave thing to do and that's what's happening they're just going to crumble away gently over the next few hundreds of years my sense of being on ground intended for purposes transcending the profane was heightened by a number of buildings that resembled temples or pagodas which seemed quite out of place in these military installations but the closer i came to these ruins the more any notion of a mysterious Isle of the Dead receded, and the more I imagined myself amidst the remains of our own civilization after its extinction in some future catastrophe. To me, too, as for some latter-day stranger, ignorant of the nature of our society wandering about among heaps of scrap metal and defunct machinery, the beings who had once lived and worked here were an enigma as was the purpose of the primitive contraptions and fittings inside the bunkers, the iron rails under the ceilings, the hooks on the still partially tiled walls, the shower heads the size of plates, the ramps and the soakaways. I think you get a very interesting moment in these properties between the point when they're, they're totally off the map and the, the short moment later when uh, artists are more or less forcibly deposited there to make artworks. From there being no possibility of getting in to the, the absolute welcome that's thrown at certain people to make works that give a kind of poetic to these dangerous, dirty, difficult spaces. And the first ones in have a kind of real charge and then it becomes very processional and, and, and very bleached of energy in some ways. There's much more of a charge places have to be broken into or infiltrated. Souvenir shops and point of view. Here, take the photograph, this is the point of view. You know, it's, it's all too fixed. But I don't think one should be too sort of elitist about this. You know, it's all very well if we're the first to be there, then that's fine. But it is important to try and think, how do you democratise this? But I don't think that we should 
simply slam the doors in the face of pilgrims who, you know, have been ignited by a piece of literature. As I was sitting on the breakwater, waiting for the ferryman, the evening sun emerged from behind the clouds, bathing in its light the far-reaching arc of the seashore. The tide was advancing up the river. The water was shining like tin plate, and from the radio masts above the marshes came an even, scarcely audible hum. The roofs and towers of Orford showed among the treetops, seeming so close that I could touch them. There, I thought, I was once at home. So we found the interview on KCRW with Michael Silverblatt and transcribed the interview. We were left with Zabald's words. I thought, well, I, I want to sort of play around with his words. I can't really figure out how to do that. Um, so I cut him up and I started to make these, you know, very strange little poems. I was convinced that this was like a Ouija board, you know, that if I did this in the right frame of mind, that he would talk to me. I mean, I assume that Sable must have known the Freud essay on the uncanny, and Freud says something very simple in the essay, which is that um, when we have what we think of as an uncanny experience, it actually is a recovery of an experience that was once familiar and then had to be estranged in some way. So that if I go somewhere and have an experience of deja vu, say, or I feel something uncanny is happening to me, it's because, unknown to myself, I'm having a memory of an earlier experience that was probably pleasurable, but I had to in some way disown. The most uncanny place is one's home. As in, it appears to be the most familiar place, but actually it's the most unfamiliar place. He wasn't at home in Germany, he wasn't at home in Norwich, so I, I asked him if he'd ever been in a place where he felt at home. And he said that he thought of one place, um, and it, it was the island of Saint-Pierre in the Lac de Bienne in Switzerland, and it, it's best known because it was where Rousseau took refuge in 1765. And what, what he said, and I, I can read this because uh, this so it's exact. He, he said, I felt at home strangely because it is a miniature world. One manor house, one farmhouse, a vineyard, a field of potatoes, a field of wheat, a cherry tree, an orchard. It is one of everything, so it is in a sense an ark. It's like when you draw a place when you were a child. I think Sable is as well wittier than he seems to be very often. I think Sable knew that only children have homes, that adults don't have homes, and that there's something childish in the best sense, and the worst sense, about the idea of home. And I think that dinky little island, with the, which is a bit like a sort of doll's house island, is, is a picture of all one's wishful fantasies about home which are to do with safety, a controllable environment, um, a kind of security in terms of invasions. And it's a bit like this is a toy that he's placed on the map of his books, as if to say, wouldn't it be nice if it could ever be like this? But actually, it's exactly the opposite. We're not on an island, we're all interconnected. And we're interconnected in ways that are horrifying to us very often. That's where he wanted to end up. Um, you know, I always think, I think it was Diane Arbus, strangely, another photographer who said that, you know, the gods in their kind of playful glee put us down in the wrong place and that we spend our entire life trying to not find the place where we're supposed to be, but to find who we were supposed to be. Zebelt's rise to the literary pantheon was remarkable. It happened in less than 10 years. He went from being 
unknown to being raised on the shoulders of opinion formers on both sides of the Atlantic. And had he not died, I feel sure he would by now have won the Nobel Prize. Many people have said as much. Well, I, I didn't meet him exactly. I saw him, I mean, I saw him in the flesh one time. We were, we were both doing um, programs in Broadcasting House. And you know, you go into that lift where nobody talks to each other to come down. And I heard this conversation um, with, with him, and, and uh, there'd been a piece in the one of the standard or one of the papers that afternoon saying Sebold was refusing absolutely to do more than one interview for this book. And while we're standing there in the lift, with he's got his PR woman with him, and they're describing four other interviews that they're going to do that afternoon. And he was looking, he was looked the kind of most weary man I'd ever seen in my life. Um, he was a moustache, and, and he, he looked very exhausted by the whole process. And, and yet there was a kind of twinkle that he, I thought, maybe everything with him isn't to be taken at face value. And it was a, that accidental thing of two completely strangers who didn't know each other, just standing in this lift, you know, a couple of minutes going down, and he walks away into doing his interviews, and I walk off back to Hackney. But I, I was really, really pleased to have that moment, like, again, the, the painting of Monsieur Courbet on the road, you know, here, here, this man with his rucksack and his hat and the two strangers see each other on a road and, and pass in, in different directions. And um, so he, he kind of figured there for me strongly as an icon from that, that one single incident. But this was a, a, a gentleman. I think he was probably one of the gentlest people that I have ever had dealings with. You could not but like him, even as you admired him. I mean, there was something uh, profoundly likable about him. I wouldn't say that I knew him well, but I liked him very much, and we certainly saw each other pretty often for a spell. Everything about him felt soft, the, everything sort of gentle and unobtrusive, but absolutely watchful and wary, and with a, and I'm not just sort of back forming this either from the books, but with a sense that he might get up and not come back at any moment, a sort of wandering otherness about him. I set out on foot in a northwesterly direction along the old Roman road into the thinly populated countryside that lies to the south of Halston. And I knew then as little as I know now whether walking in this solitary way was more of a pleasure or a pain. At times on that day, which I recall as being both leaden and unreal, a gap would open up among the billowing clouds. Then the rays of sun would reach down to the earth, lighting up patches here and there and making a fan-shaped pattern as they descended, of the sort that used to appear in religious pictures symbolizing the presence above us of grace and providence. It was afternoon by the time I came to the lane which leaves the Roman road across a cattle grid and leads through a meadow to Chestnut Tree Farm, an ancient moated house where Thomas Abrams has been working on a model of the Temple of Jerusalem for a good 20 years. He spent 18 years bringing back the temple, which was the opulent focus for religious worship in Jerusalem when Jesus was alive. But why did the 67-year-old decide to focus on this particular piece of history? Constable decided to paint a picture and I decided to build a temple. Now pilgrims and scholars from all over the world trek to the village of Fressingfield to see the largest and most detailed model of its kind. And as the Easter weekend approaches, even more visitors have booked to see it. I'm quite proud, but, uh, you know, it's like everything else. It's uh, just a way of life to me, and I enjoy it. 100,000 handmade clay bricks and 3,500 painted figures have gone into it, and it still isn't complete. But that doesn't deter the experts. In Jerusalem, there's plans to rebuild a full-scale version of King Herod's temple. They're using Suffolk's miniature version as a blueprint for the real thing. Sarah Doyle, Anglia News. As I took my leave and mentioned that I'd walked over from Yoxford and was now going on to Halston, 
Thomas said that he would drive me, as he had an errand in town anyway. So we spent the quarter of an hour to Halston sitting side by side in the cab of his truck, and I wished that the short drive through the country would never come to an end, that we could go on and on, all the way to Jerusalem. But instead, I had to get out at the Saracen's Head in Halston, an inn several centuries old whose guest rooms, as it transpired, were furnished with the most fearful pieces one can imagine. I don't know where it quite comes from, but I do like to uh, listen to people who have been sidelined for one reason or another. Because in my experience, once they begin to talk, they have to tell you, they have things to tell you that you won't be able to get from anywhere else. And I felt that need of being able to listen to people telling me things from very early on, not least, I think, because I grew up in post-war Germany where there was, I say that quite often, something like a cons conspiracy of silence, i.e., you know, your parents never told you anything about their experiences because there was, at the very least, a great deal of shame attached to these experiences. So one kept them under lock and seal, and I, for one, doubt, you know, that uh, my mother and father, even amongst themselves, ever, you know, broached any of these subjects. And there wasn't a written or a uh, spoken agreement about these things. It was a tacit agreement. It was something that was never touched on. So I've always, I've grown up feeling, you know, that there is some sort of emptiness somewhere that needs to be filled by accounts from witnesses one can trust. The sable narrator is kind of on the run, and what he's most fearful of is stopping. But he keeps having his attention arrested, and it's the moment at which he stops that something happens, that it's as though he begins to accumulate stuff that is eventually going to be incorporated in a narrative. So it's as though he begins by saying, I want to tell you a story about a walk, and by the end he's telling you, I've in fact told you a story about the catastrophes of Western culture since the Second World War and before. So that the fear is that if you allow yourself to become a writer, the catastrophe will be like an avalanche. Whereas if you keep walking, you might be okay. The subtitle of The Rings of Saturn is an English pilgrimage. And it's a very curious title when you think about it, because a pilgrimage is a, is a movement towards healing, towards resolution, towards self-understanding and actually what this foot journey results in is catastrophic dilapidation of foundations, uh, a vanishing of uh, stabilities and it, it puts him in hospital. What are we trying to accomplish by doing this, going on this trip? You know, are we trying to prove that he did it? Are we trying to experience what he experienced? Um, or do we just not care and we're just going to have a good old time? One thing that's happened in the last decade, there's been this huge revival of pilgrimage across the world, in fact, so that um, on the way to Santiago de Compostela, they're reopening these medieval hostelries, which have been closed for decades or hundreds of years. And there's definitely some modern desire to find meaning through physical effort. It's interesting because the word pilgrimage, in English at least, has the word image in it. After we got back, I did some research and I found these maps that were created for pilgrims that didn't actually go on pilgrimages. They would use them to sort of meditate on and use the images to move their mind through the different parts of, of the land on their way to Jerusalem. Um, they were called itinerary maps. It's rather what Wim Wenders said about Kings of the Road, that you have an itinerary once you have an itinerary, it becomes quite easy to kind of write, in a way. Something I never worked out, you know, you sit in a room day after day, and you think, well, what will I write about today? And if you actually go out for a walk, and you walk 15 miles, you know, you're going to get enough for, for 750 words, 1,000 words, no trouble at all. I think it wasn't until I did my East Anglian journey that I kind of thought, this is a doddle. You know, you kind of go to Cromer, oh, you have plenty to write about in Cromer, then you move on around the coast, oh look, there's a kind of old Cold War, early warning station, you know, so, so 
it sort of takes care of itself. I don't think that works at all anymore now because they're all doing it. You know, the, the, the countryside is black with people going for walks to write books. The, the only way to do it is obviously you, you have to walk somewhere ever more extreme in other um, more and more peculiar circumstances. I wouldn't get away with just walking around the M25 orbital motorway now. You know, you'd have to you'd have to walk around the six orbital motorways of Beijing. The last ten years have been so kind of mediated that I'm sure that people feel a desire to go and. You know, people are going a lot of, in the art world now, that a, lot, a lot of artists are going and finding extraordinary places. I know artists have gone to Antarctica, to, you know, everywhere. I mean, it's a globalisation in extremis. I think people do feel that there is increasing homogenisation of the country, that places are actually becoming less places. They're becoming more like spaces. They're becoming more abstract. They're becoming infinitely reproducible. What's important for Sebald is that actually he finds the particular within them. He finds why this place is important, why this particular hall is important, because this person stayed here, because this event happened on this place, because here there was a village and now there is no longer a village. He encourages a deeper form of engagement with the place and he is now a layer of that history of which he writes. You know, he wasn't while he was walking, but he is now. You know, he's a very definite part of, of that landscape. This is a, this is a pilgrimage because the man is dead. The man is dead, and so he, he, he's, he's ripe for a cult. And the, and the way you would read his book is to think that you could follow along his track and get some insight into it, whereas I think that's probably completely untrue. It's probably the worst way to get an insight into what he's doing is to literally follow along because he, he's a mythologist and a lot of the things in there he's invented. You want, to, you want to understand his methods, not the kind of literal sense of being out there. Although, why not do that walk? It is a great walk. Enjoy it. It's not by chance that after that walking holiday he collapsed and he found himself in a hospital. There's an undertow, isn't there, of some sort of despair or some inability to connect to where he is, some attempt to belong somewhere in some place. And, and maybe that appeals to us, you know, maybe that's what we want, maybe all things material that we try to construct in order to contain the chaos or the fears or whatever it is, he sort of goes, well, they aren't actually valid, they don't have any meaning. And there's great comfort in that, when everything collapses around you, isn't there? Ditchingham Churchyard was the very last stop on my walk through the county of Suffolk. The afternoon was already drawing to a close, and so I decided to return to the main road and continue a short way in the direction of Norwich to the Mermaid in Headenham, where the bar would be opening soon. I would be able to phone home from there to be picked up. Right near the beginning of Wings of Saturn, there's a photograph of Southwold Lighthouse, and I was aware this was also the place where Peter Greenway's um, Drowning by Numbers was filmed. And so they took the ritual which is found within um, Drowning by Numbers, where the, um, the son of the, the coroner, at each point that he comes across a death in the film, he lets off a firework. And so I decided as a, as a mark of memorial that I'd set off a firework by the side of the road where Sebo died. I got back home that evening and was looking at the photographs on, on the computer. And what I typically wanted was not the flash of light, but the smoke, very Sebaldian substance. And so I had four photographs where the smoke was, was making nice shapes, and so I was very pleased with those. And then I looked at the final image 
that I took and Now, as I write, and think once more of our history, which is but a long account of calamities, it occurs to me that at one time the only acceptable expression of profound grief for ladies of the upper classes was to wear heavy robes of black silk taffeta or black crepe de chine. And Sir Thomas Brown, who was the son of a silk merchant, and may well have had an eye for these things, remarks in a passage of the Pseudodoxia Epidemica that I can no longer find, that in the Holland of his time, it was customary in a home where there had been a death to drape black mourning ribbons over all the mirrors and all canvases depicting landscapes or people or the fruits of the field, so that the soul, as it left the body, would not be distracted on its final journey, either by a reflection of itself or by a last glimpse of the land now being lost forever. <laughs> 